How can companies be sparking AI innovation systematically? Start with the impact you want to have. What kind of problem are you looking to solve? Which kind of client are you looking to serve? When you create machine learning products and services, you need an ongoing process because as you know, right, models don't magically learn themselves and become better, but you need to monitor them. Taking yourself out of the day-to-day -day business context and thinking about the wider context of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also part of what we try to live at Marantix and Marantix Labs. Nicole, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I have been excited about this episode for a long time. You have such an amazing perspective on uh, commercial applications of AI. And I can't wait for the audience to hear everything you have to say. First off, where in the world are you, Nicole? Right now, in this very moment, I'm actually sitting in Switzerland, um, but oh. actually the company is based in Berlin. So I spend most of my time working out of Berlin. Nice, and it's too bad. I think even in the video version of the podcast, the view over your shoulder will likely be cut out, <laughs> but it looks magnificent. So I could see why you're spending time in Switzerland uh, while well, you can. Um, so I know you through Rasmus, uh, who uh, is the founder and CTO of Morantix, which we're going to talk about uh, a fair bit in a moment. And uh, I've known Rasmus for a long time. So when he was doing his undergrad at Oxford, I was doing my PhD. And we were both members of the Oxford Entrepreneurs Student Society. And so, whew, I mean, that's more than a decade that we've known each other. And every once in a while, he'll be in New York and we catch up. And every time we catch up, I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe the another enormous order of magnitude uh, increase in success that he's had. So um, if people want to hear from Rasmus directly, prior to hosting the Super Data Science podcast, I piloted my own podcast called the Artificial Neural Network News Network, A4N, and Rasmus was a guest on that show. He was on episode four, so you can hear from him. But this episode is all about Nicole. Uh, so Nicole is on the management board of Morantix, which is a super cool company. It's an AI venture studio. And Nicole will be able to provide you with more information on exactly what that means. But the idea is that you have, you incubate companies from scratch. I think even a lot of the time you help create the founding teams and you help them figure out what idea they will be uh, working on. And to give a little bit of context on that, uh, examples of very successful ventures that have in their own rights either raised uh, tens of millions of euros <laughs> in funding or even been acquired include Vera Healthcare, which does uh, machine vision models that can detect tumors. And I think originally it was uh, breast cancer, but maybe there it's other cancers now as well. You can speak to that when I finally give you a chance to speak. Uh, and um, uh, Sia Search, uh, also works in machine vision, but they were uh, labeling data that comes from self-driving cars. So there's tons of sensors on self-driving cars that gather tons and tons and tons of information. And so being able to label those data and find pedestrians or stop signs and that kind of thing. So these two separate ventures, Sia Search, which has now been acquired by Scale AI, Vera Healthcare, which is doing extremely well as a standalone startup. Uh, this is a perfect example of how Morantix can be hugely valuable to incubating these AI ventures because they both involve machine vision. So this gives a perfect example of how uh, two different kinds of companies with different application areas have overlapping um, underlying R&D. They're both involved in machine vision. So in terms of how we engineer this, how we scale it, there's common knowledge that can be shared. And so, yeah, so this, this shows... Uh, one example of how this AI studio model can be so helpful. And uh, clearly it's doing very well. Uh, those kinds of early examples like Vera Healthcare and Sia Search um, having such early success, including that acquisition, um, has led to lots of funding. Uh, now $30 million in funding, including investment from SoftBank, one of the biggest names in venture capital investing. Um, so that gives, you, that gives you some context on what Morantix does and alongside 
all of those ventures, there's also something called Morantix Labs. And Nicole is the CEO of Morantix Labs. So Nicole, <laughs> I've been speaking for way too long trying to get some context. So one, feel free to correct any of the mistakes that I made or add a bit more color on the Morantix Ventures and then tell us about Morantix Labs and what you do. Sure, thank you very much, John, for the invitation. Really happy to be here. And um, yeah, I'll talk a little about Morantix and I, and I agree, uh, actually you've, you've raved about Rasmus and I think that was also one of the reasons um, why I joined Morantix, to be very frank, because the, the quality of people is just extraordinary. Also Adrian, who's, who's uh, Rasmus's co-founder, I, I want to say at that stage of my career, I was really um, yeah, looking for the quality of people I would be working with, curious minds who are brilliant in their respective fields. And, and that's what I really found at Morantix and, and happy I made that. I took that decision two and a half years ago. Um, I think you've already given a pretty good um, <laughs> overview of Morantix. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we're basically looking to really create impactful applications from AI, right? There's a lot of AI research going on, and we also do some of that at Morantix Labs. Um, but for us, the main driver is really to create commercially successful companies that have real world impact. So to make this, this technology useful, I would say, for mankind, for industry, uh, for, for everybody, um, you know, in, in the economy and society. And that's really what our ventures do. And some of them, you've mentioned some of our some of our uh, ventures that are more advanced. And we've also incubated um, some new companies in very interesting fields. One, for example, is Brink in the ESG compliance space, a more an NLP focused company, for example, uh, focusing more on language. And another one would, for example, be a Terra Lumina in the nutraceutical space. So really... Um, let's say more a, a drug or, in, or um, supplement discovery space to understand what is really, um, what are the powers that lie in the plant universe and how can we leverage the best uh, for mankind? So there are really a lot of topics that uh, we, we think about. And um, yeah, I think the common denominator, everybody's very curious. People are excellent in what they do and they really want to create impact with their companies. And that's how I, then entered Morantix as a founder as well. So I joined Morantix two and a half years ago as a founder um, oh. and um, and created Morantix Labs. Um, so yeah, that was really that was really sort of sort of my story. And I would say Morantix Labs is a little bit different, probably also from Morantix um, other ventures, because we're first of all more of a subsidiary. So we will probably. Uh, we're not raising any more capital in the market. We're profitable. Right. Um, and also we're an integral part of the studio. And also um, we're a service provider. We're not building a product, but we're basically taking this knowledge of data-driven, AI-driven business model that we have from creating ventures and infusing it into existing organizations and companies um, that exist. So we're, we're working with big, um, you know, Fortune 500 DAX companies, um, as well as world champions, SMEs, we have a lot of those in Germany and in that region, um, you know, that builds components that go into products that you know from everyday life, that companies mm -hmm. you've never heard of. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know that piece that Morantix Labs was kind of, so the, Morant the Morantix AI Venture Studio has created lots of these ventures. We've named some of them Vera Healthcare, Sia Search, Brink, Cambrium, and then Morantix Labs, that was initially just another kind of venture uh, that you were the founder of, but then now it has this special status within the firm where the other ventures attract outside investment or could be acquired. Morantix Labs is this wholly owned subsidiary focusing on um, AI R&D and operationalizing AI for corporate clients. Mm -hmm. And amazing to hear that you're already profitable. That's super cool in such a short time. Mm. Yeah, and, and so, I would say the reason why this fits into the universe so well, right, is that we're trying to get together really good research um, and make it industry uh, really industry relevant. So Morantix Labs sort of builds this bridge into industry and is also the vehicle through which we conduct corporate R&D, but also some research projects with, with, with excellent academic institutions. Um, and 
you know, th that gives us insights that inform, okay, these are the type of problems that industries have and that industry in general has, and maybe we need to develop some solutions or ventures around this. And the other side, we obviously bring in the founders and some experts in some fields, and that also is very beneficial for us to kind of understand certain spaces better. So it's a really nice synergy, and, and that's why we made it a more permanent, I would say, fixture in the, totally. in the Rantix universe. Yeah. I can see that they complement each other very well. And I and they they complement each other so well, in fact, and you're doing such a great job running the Morantix Labs subsidiary that you've been invited to be on the management board alongside Adrian and Rasmus um, of the broader uh, Morantix AI Venture Studio. So congratulations, Nicole. <laughs> um, so the the thing that I saw on LinkedIn that immediately compelled me to reach out to Rasmus and ask if he could introduce me to you and we could have you on the show was because I saw that you'd given this talk on how to spark AI innovation, which clearly you are a global expert on. So, um, so yeah, help us with that. So whether you are a, a company that maybe just has some data that you've collected and you're not sure how to innovate with machine learning with those data, or maybe you're even earlier stage and you, you're not even systematically collecting your data in any way, how can companies be sparking AI innovation systematically? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question that's sort of um, a universal question almost in, in organizations of different sizes. And I think also kind of a key question if you want to stay relevant as a business, um, because it also asks the question, how can we use AI for me, it means how can we use AI to transform our business model, create new products and services, serve our clients better, et cetera. Um, so I would say there are like two, three points I want to stress with this. First is start with the impact you want to have. So I know we're like the AI shop and we will look at it from the AI angle and we will tell you, is this an AI problem or not? Can we solve this with AI or not? Um, but I think the main thing is really what kind of problem are you looking to solve? Which kind of client are you looking to serve? And what is a solution you can envision? And then AI can be an instrument, but I think it's sort of um, no use to try to implement AI just for the sake of it. I, I myself, right, I'm an economist by training and not an engineer computer scientist. So I, I believe in technology as an instrument. And that's also the way I look at AI. And I think that's also how organizations should look at it. Um, I think a, a second really essential point is um, don't be too afraid of trying things out. Often, this might be a very German perspective. I don't know. It's an engineering heavy country. Um, but often I hear, oh, we need to build first all the architecture and the whole data architecture and the house. And then we can think about use cases. And I, I always think, yeah, no, you'll never be done building that house because, you know, even tech first companies, they just kind of tear it down every few years and rebuild it um, because technology is advancing so fast. So, so maybe let go of this notion um, that you, you know, you can create structures that will last forever. <laughs> it's a fast paced environment. And I think personally creating even data infrastructure, data architectures without knowing the use case is pretty obsolete um, because it, it, it will determine what kind of architecture and infrastructure you actually need to serve this use case, right? So I would say be open to this being an ongoing process. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's maybe something if you're, if you're used to building a project and designing one model and then go like, okay, now we mass produce, that might be a new notion for you. But right. that's kind of um, how you have to think about it. And then and, and so the willingness to experiment with that, I think, is, is really, um, really, really key. Many thanks to the Master of Data Science program at the University of California, Irvine, for sponsoring today's episode. The UC Irvine Master of Data Science program blends statistics and computer science principles with partners from industry to empower students to innovate in the field of data science. Located on the tech coast of Southern California, students of the program will enjoy a powerhouse ecosystem where over a third of Fortune 500 companies are located. Take a giant leap in your data science career through the UC Irvine Master of Data Science program. To learn more, head to superdatascience.com slash UCI. That's superdatascience.com slash UCI. Check it out.
Um, and I think thirdly, um, you know, it's, it's really a matter of culture and safe space. So we're in the deep tech sector and I like to say uh, the more deep tech I go, the more uh, touchy feely it, it gets, right? Because this <laughs> is, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 you know, this technology sparks many fantasies and also a lot of dystopian um, fantasies of people and, you know, the fear of being obsolete or what is my purpose here and so on. And organizations are ultimately, you know, we're all people and we all also in like little things have resistance to change. That's just how we work. You know, even I have to like change my brand of, I don't know what coffee. I'm like, Oh, I don't like that. You know? Um, so I think being aware of that and really understanding that you have to um, create a safe space for this innovation as a leadership team and as a whole organization. And yeah, that it's also a, a cultural transformation for most companies. I mean, especially here in Germany, a lot of companies have been around for centuries, right? And have developed um, very high expertise and excellence um, over centuries. And, and you know, it, that's a cultural shift and you have to embrace it and create a safe space for it. Cool. So to spark AI innovation, three points from you, Nicole. We want to identify what problem we're solving uh, AI could be an instrument for solving it, but maybe there is some other solution out there or uh, some complementary solution. The second thing is to not be afraid to start or experiment because uh, we can't architect the perfect solution uh, before we started anyway. And then the third one is to create a safe space for innovation. I love these. Um, I love in particular the second one. It's if you want to spark AI innovation, you have to start <laughs> doing some innovation. Um, right. Perfect. So in terms of a specific example of a recurring problem that you help clients out with, I know that you often come across small, unbalanced data sets that need to be labeled. And so a big part of the R&D function at Morantix Labs is uh, using unsupervised learning models to solve these data labeling issues. Do you have um, any maybe kind of interesting case studies, obviously without divulging proprietary information, but you know some kinds of examples that add color to that um, to that use case. Um, sure. So I mean, I would say the problem is one that um, that, that that it goes back to I guess the way um, industry structured maybe in Germany in particular in Europe, but also something that also bigger corporates come across. Right. If you want to build machine learning applications, often we're talking about supervised models. So you need labeled data sets and it all looks great in academia when you study the field and you think, oh, here I have my class and then I have this class and then I train a model. And then you look at reality and you're like, oh my God, this looks horrible. Um, it's way smaller uh, than people think. Um, people are always saying, oh no, we have enough data. It's always less than they think. It's always less mm -hmm. balanced than they think. And it's always a mm -hmm. pain labeling it in the end, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so we believe trying to create really scalable impact we have to provide, um, this, is, this is a really universal problem, large or small organizations, and we have to provide a solution that addresses this. And our solution conceptually is to say, okay, we want to build big models because also, right, the bigger, the more parameters and data go into a model, the better it, it is just in, in a very simplistic way of looking at it. And so we want to build big models that perform really well and we want to use um, unsupervised models because uh, we just have much bigger un uh, unlabeled data sets than labeled data sets. Totally. Usually. And then we want to um, use these unsupervised models and fine tune them with labeled data sets to very domain specific areas. And I think that's a very powerful idea. And that's something that's methodologically not completely solved yet in all areas. Um, but we have our brilliant VP of machine learning research, Johannes, who um, uh, came from came from OpenAI and other other big shops um, to us to lead this effort, and who is doing a really great job to develop a lot of the methodologies we need to create this. And this is, for example, something we do in the language space, right? Um, I mean, talking about language models, um, you obviously have a huge corpus of text um, available in the internet. <laughs> Um, but mm -hmm. when you think about more domain specific applications, and that's usually what corporates need, they very rarely have use cases where you just use the internet. It's like usually in the legal field or you have something 
that's very specific to creating certain offers for clients or to finding details in some of your agreements, um, et cetera, or workflows, um, then you then you basically need something like this to 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 understand this. And I think this is one of the powerful applications um, in the in the field of language. And then we are also looking at this, for example, to serve SMEs because they're in addition, you know, you have um, a lot of companies that are very siloed and small. So per se have smaller data sets. And we're really looking for scalable models to serve these companies and to bring them into the 21st century. So for example, one of the um, use cases we're working on is in computer aided manufacturing. One mm. of the processes here in Germany, right? We have a lot of machinery producers and so on is um, they basically get a sketch, which is a computer aided design from one of their clients to say, hey, we need this component when building this car. And then they have to try out on a machine how to make this part, this prototype part from, I don't know, a block of metal. Have to like uh, remove some parts, for example. It's a, it's a subtractive method. Yeah, and, sculpt and this, it. Yes, exactly. And this like a can block take many, of marble. Exactly. And this can take many iterations and obviously it's like time consuming. You need a specialized engineer doing it. And, you know, it's also resource consuming, ultimately. And, and to sort of make these iterations faster, it's really useful to understand which are general rules to translate these computer designs in, into the manufacturing instructions, right? Because you want to basically program a machine to then build this part out of this metal block. And that's a, a subject that many manufacturers deal with in, in Europe and in Germany in specific, specifically. And some of them compete with each other, but not necessarily all of them, right? You can be building many parts. And where, where the same logic can be very powerful because you can train bigger models on this fundamental mechanic and then fine tune it on a more specialized area with a labeled data set and, and just become that much more impactful and, and faster to serve a client. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I understand completely. This is... Um... This is definitely a super powerful approach that you're taking where you have these very large unsupervised data sets. Like you gave the example of you could use all of the internet. So you could use all of the English on the internet or all of the German on the internet, or maybe even a, a combination of languages, all of the language on the internet. And you can pre-train a gigantic language model to understand in a way to have an, a, a representation of the meaning of words. Uh, and maybe even be able to translate between the English version of a word and the German version of a word. So then we take that gigantic model that was trained on a very, very large unsupervised data set that doesn't have any labels, and then you can fine tune it to some specific uh, domain specific problem that one of your clients is looking to solve. And, and they might have a relatively small amount of label data that you can use to uh, fine tune and then validate that. Uh, the way that you fine-tuned it to their problem uh, will be effective in practice. Amazing, Nicole. So that was a really cool example of a specific R&D problem that you're solving. It sounds like with that kind of problem, there would probably be some components that you could reuse um, between different projects. So you could have a giant language model, say, that... Uh, hasn't been pre-trained to any particular purpose. And then that could maybe be reused for multiple different projects, fine-tuned to multiple different um, specific domain, uh, smaller data sets. So does this kind of, do these kinds of reusable components make it easier for you to tackle projects and then deliver your projects efficiently? Mm, for sure. I think that's a really important um, a topic you're mentioning here. So we're essentially a project organization, right? We build cool code for, for, for other companies. And so this has a project character, but still, I mean, we have an AI DNA, so we don't want to be manually doing the same stuff all over that we can automate or build and, and repurpose. And I think a good, um, a good example um, for, for really excellence and delivery, right? And also to build these scalable models where you can deliver impact fast is, is when we go back to computer vision, right? I think if you... You have some of these open source libraries and computer vision. Pretty much you can probably, you know, build a classifier from anywhere in an internet cafe using some of these <laughs> libraries. But 
Then if you yes. have more specific problems, like it's really big images and you're looking for really small things in those images, right? Then maybe some of these libraries are not so effective. But still, these problems are quite common again, right? So um, three of these domains, for example, that we would tackle with similar components, right? We, we like to call this particular component chameleon, for example, in our family of, of, of in our zoo of, uh, of models is um, we, we can use basically in cases from medical imaging, right? When you're looking at really high resolution pictures and looking for really small cell defects um, or anomalies as you mm -hmm. do in cancer detection. Um, mm -hmm. But also if you look at, for example, satellite images, right? When you're looking, when you're looking at all the earth observation applications that you have, where you have really big images and you're also looking for pretty tiny stuff, you're looking for... Um, a specific uh, crop defect, you're looking for a specific demarcation, you're looking for maybe a person um, moving um, or a boat or something like that. Um, that's a very similar problem. And then jumping to a third application, for example, is damage recognition. When, um, you know, for example, we, we also built a model for uh, a company here in Germany and it's all about, you know, returning cars, basically, and, and damage estimation on cars. And there you have, you know, the weirdest perspectives and everything, and ultimately, you know, partly tiny scratches or dents from hail or whatever. And you still need to work with this um, information in small pixels. Also something in autonomous driving. Right. You know, right. when you look at very small pallets on the road that take up very few pixels in the image. And so this, I think, is a really good example for building reusable components that go beyond, you know, your open source libraries that are sort of... Um, quite commoditized, but that are still very useful and transferable across domains and that can be fine-tuned um, on specific domains. And then obviously how to fine-tune that and so on, right? That's a lot of the secret sauce uh, that our engineering department has figured out. Um, but I think those are, those are quite powerful um, applications. Cool. Thank you, Nicole, for so many rich examples that illustrate this idea of reusable components and how they make uh, delivery of projects more efficient. Struggling with broken pipelines, stale dashboards, missing data? You're not alone. Look no further than Monte Carlo, the leading end-to-end -end data observability platform. In the same way that New Relic and Datadog ensure reliable software and keep application downtime at bay, Monte Carlo solves the costly problem of data downtime. As detailed in episode number 499 with the firm's brilliant CEO, Bar Moses, Monte Carlo monitors and alerts for data issues across your data warehouses, lakes, ETL, and business intelligence, reducing data incidents by 90% or more. Start trusting your data with Monte Carlo today. Visit www.montecarlodata.com to learn more. So going from those specific examples to something more general, I know that you have something called an AI canvas approach. It's a model for successful AI transformation. Can you tell us about this AI canvas model? Uh, sure, John. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, back to sparking innovation, right? And starting at impact. I think we developed the framework um, together with the University of St. Gallen with, them, with basically in mind that, I mean, I've been in the sector for like, Oh God, I hate to say this, like almost 10 years. Um, but, <laughs> um, and you know, the, the, the evolution has been some companies are obviously AI natives and they have had this in their business model from the very beginning, but most organizations, you know, quite timid. A lot of them are still not really using the technology, but anyway, starting with prototypes and first uh, tries to sort of um, experiment with the technology. And what we realized is that a lot of these organizations have difficulty then scaling this application into a really powerful organization-wide real life application that also can unfold impact and give mm -hmm. some return on investment and not just uh, basically some investment. And that was the very first point, starting point of starting this canvas and say, okay, what are actually some of the key components and areas you have to focus on, even at the very beginning stages, just so you know what's, what's coming along the journey if you want to build a scalable AI application. And obviously, when you're building the first prototype, you don't have to think about all the legal ramifications, but it's good to know about them because maybe that's ultimately a showstopper and you don't want to go down that road. 
So, um, so we've basically created a framework that's divided into different sections. One is um, a business section, so very much focused on the pain point, the impact you want to have with, with the solution you're building. And it's, it sounds very trivial, but really it's worth thinking about this a lot. I've seen many applications. It sounded great and we read about AI and then we created this use case and ultimately management, like what kind of problem are we solving here? Like this is not relevant for our organization. And then you lose buy-in and people are, you know, people don't get promotions for it and leadership is not interested and then it dies down slowly. And I think, you know, nobody's motivated to build, to build these kind of use cases. So impact is key. I cannot stress this enough. That's the first, you know, what kind of investment do you want? What could be a way to actually monetize this then again? What's your business? How does this change your business model? All these questions go into this first block. The second one is focused on organization. An organization goes to the, to the fact that when you create machine learning products and services, you need an ongoing process. Because as you know, right, models don't magically learn themselves and become better, but you need to monitor them. You need to make sure that they're still doing what you want. This needs to still be aligned with your business purpose, et cetera. So you also need quite efficient and effective ways of organizing people that need to take decisions on which use cases to prioritize, but also who is taking responsibility for these models and how do we take decisions. And I think that's also often a component to think about as a business to create these I don't want to say agile, but dynamic structures um, that correspond to also the technology. The third component is more focused on data and technology. So what kind of data do you need? Data architectures It's focused on, um, you know, your tech stack, which tools do you use? Um, it's focused on things like compliance, safety, robustness, other regulatory concerns. Um, and they're also very important. Right, to keep in mind and to sort of understand what are also some of the risks, some of the fields we need to master. And the fourth, tying everything together, is this kind of AI life cycle. Just to stress, it's an iterative process. It's not I build something, I, I install it, and then I look the other way. It would probably run, and maybe I need to do a few bug fixes. It's a constant, incessant process, so to speak, that you that you need to stay involved with. And I think that's something that makes it quite complex, especially because the technological advances are so fast. And you need, you need to make sure that your whole calibration is still up to date um, and that you're still using the right components, et cetera, et cetera. Regulation, everything is um, changing quite quickly. And, and yeah, and um, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've, um, we've basically managed to um, you know, train a lot of companies on this framework. A lot of companies just kind of go to our website and download it and use it as a first orientation guideline. Mm. But we also implement like whole AI hubs within organization using this within organizations using this approach. And I'm and I'm really happy um, that we could develop this with the University of St. Gallen because you know they have academic excellence, especially. I mean, we we chose a business school for a reason, right? We also have close ties, obviously, to engineering schools, but this was really for us quite key to um, work with a a school that has excellence in management and business impact because that's ultimately what we want to create. So we wanted to give a toolkit for everybody, sort of from the management and business side, trying to approach AI and use cases. Cool. Thank you for that explanation of the AI canvas uh, that allows companies of any size to be able to uh, successfully transform their organization with AI. And you talked about the key pieces there, you know, knowing what the impact is going to be ahead of time, uh, figuring out what data are needed, and then uh, monitoring throughout the AI lifecycle. My next question was going to be if there's some place that people can get access to this, and it sounds like we can get it right from the Morantix website. Yes. Uh, and so we will be sure to include a link in the show notes to that, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to be able to follow along in all of the detail provided. Um, lots of organizations out there that want to be doing AI transformation. So you mentioned a couple of times there that this was in collaboration with St. Gallen University. And I love that you mentioned them, that you've been working with them. I have such a strong affinity for this university. So I attended in 2013 and 2014 something called the St. Gallen Symposium, which I understand you have attended as well. So you attended it as a student at St. Gallen University. You did 
your bachelor's and your master's degree there in quantitative economics and finance, which is such a cool background for uh, what you're doing today. Um, and then you were invited back last year to be a speaker at the symposium. So this symposium for me as an attendee was a life-changing experience. I met some of the top thinkers from all over the world. Um, it, either So there's a blend of young people and more experienced leaders. So what they call leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow. And those leaders of today, it could be like the CEO of Microsoft or <laughs> yeah. Christine Lagarde. <laughs> um, and so these really are, these are the, the top <laughs> business and political leaders on the planet go to the symposium. Yes. yes. The, but the unique thing is that young people get invited as well. So these leaders of tomorrow, which I was in, in you know, uh, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, so you, you get these amazing people, these leaders of tomorrow also from all over the world. And for me at that time, it was a really eye-opening thing. I realized that I could be and should be doing something much more impactful with my career than I was at that time. And so it, it completely recalibrated the way I was thinking about what I could do with my life. And yeah, also the connections that I made there, the you know, lifelong friends that, um, that, that I've made. Um, so the St. Gallen Symposium, absolutely incredible opportunity. And I would love uh, to hear more about, you know, kind of your experience there, um, especially, uh, you know, as a speaker recently, but to let listeners know if this sounds incredible to you and you would like to be invited as a leader of tomorrow to the St. Gallen Symposium, uh, well, you can actually go for free. <laughs> so this might sound too good to be true. So Nicole and I can vouch that this is not some kind of scam. So you can <laughs> simply submit an essay and essays are due soon. They're due on February 1st. But if you're under 30, I believe the cutoff is, and you're a student in a master's or PhD program, then all you have to do is write an essay. And if your essay is one of the hundreds selected, um, then you get free flights, free accommodation, free attendance, everything free, food, everything uh, at the symposium. And the, the idea being that that bridges the leaders of tomorrow with the leaders of today. And in case you're wondering, this is bankrolled <laughs> by the leaders of today who sponsor it uh, and pay to be there uh, to have this opportunity to meet so many different uh, young people. So uh, again, I've now been doing this long monologue, Nicole, correct me on the things that I got wrong. And yeah, just let us know about your experience at uh, the world's leading uh, German language business school, as well as the symposium in particular. Mm. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I think what's what's uh, quite fascinating, and I mean, I was a student at the University of St. Gallen when I first attended, is that it's all also student organized, right? This is basically oh, a yeah. student initiative and it's student led. And from the drivers you meet that pick you up from the airport, it's super professional, <laughs> right? Um, right? Yeah. They're all also uh, students at this elite university and, and everything is sort of um, on a very uh, professional and inspiring level. And I think for me as well, what I what I what I really liked about the interaction at the symposium last year when I went again, and also the first time I went, is um, taking yourself out of the day to day business context and thinking about the wider context of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also part of what we try to live at Morantix and Morantix Labs, right? Eventually, you have um, right. AI sparks so many, as I already said, like dystopian ideas. Um, and we really want to create, like make, use AI as a tool to make this world a better place, to make patient experience better, to make customer experience better, to make your experience getting some government service better, right? To make the manufacturing process more efficient, to make, uh, I don't know, better, cooler materials that are more sustainable. Um, ultimately, that's what drives us. And that's what we we want to contribute to. And I think a setting like the symposium reminds you to kind of stand back and think about, ah, am I still focusing on this? How can I, with my uh, toolkit, contribute to that? And, and that's also what I ultimately very much like about Morantix and the whole ecosystem we're operating. And we, for example, just opened the AI campus um, in April last year. In oh, Berlin. yeah. We, I, we haven't even mentioned that on air yet. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and that's really... Um, 
you know, fundamentally rooted in the belief that we need to build ecosystems to create, you know, impact and to create it fast. And, and, and basically the AI campus is this idea that, we, and it's a non-for-profit uh, uh, initiative from Arantic. So we organize it. It was a lot of, a lot of work, but we don't really make money from it. But we bring together different players that we think need to be in the same room or under the same roof to really create impactful innovation. Bring in for like also our Marantix ventures, for example, but also other ventures, even competing ventures in the space of machine learning, deep learning. Oh, we bring wow. in investors. We bring in corporates uh, and their data or AI teams or parts of them. We bring in the new, for example, um, spin-offs from universities that are machine learning and AI focused are there. Um, you know, we bring in some researchers at the time. We bring in government. The first German GovTech hub will has its home on the AI campus in Berlin um, that Marantix created. And I think that gives you a very good perspective of how we try to create um, really an ecosystem for innovation um, because, you know, it's it's such a growing field and we really need to make sure we get it right and we use it for this for the right applications that that's is we feel it's our responsibility to um, to create such a such a visibility for the field to bring people together, and also ultimately to focus it on applications that we think, you know, are are, are good applications, and also quite frankly, the power of a physical space in these times of COVID is probably mm -hmm. you know sometimes like people are probably longing have this weird feeling of longing again for physical meetings, but. It also mm -hmm. means, you know, it's a physical space in a neighborhood of Berlin. These are real people. These are the people building these applications. So it's also a place where we take responsibility. We show face. We're like, we're these people behind these companies. We're these people building it. And, you know, it's in the middle of, really in the middle of Berlin um, and quite open. We do a lot of events. Um, and so I would invite you also to check out AI Campus um, Berlin to look at some of the events are open for everybody. You can just tune in. Um, digitally, virtually, and connect to the community. And I think, yeah, that's quite exceptional. And that's also a huge part of what motivates me to to build this company also in this in this ecosystem. Super cool. Thank you for bringing that up. And I can't believe that it took us that long in the episode to get into the Berlin AI campus, which is an absolutely brilliant idea. I'm sure you'll see imitators all over the world. I certainly fantasize about imitating something similar in New York. Um, and I understand from Rasmus that one of the big keys to having the AI campus work so well is that you only have one coffee machine across the entire <laughs> giant building. <laughs> <laughs> Huge point of, uh, of discussion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that's true. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the watering hole. You would say everybody meets in the queue or around the coffee machine. Um, also mm -hmm. tea drinkers are included, of course. And, and, and sure, like, uh, by the way, John, if you want to create another AI campus, I think we would be the first one to do it together with you and, and to sort of even encourage imitation because uh, we really believe in this model and it's not a Morantic's only job to create these hubs in a, in a worldwide ecosystem ultimately. So, um, yeah, I think wow. that would be great. Wow, maybe you'll start having the gears turning out of fantasy and into reality. That would be yeah. extraordinary. Well, let's do it. Whew. Wow, that's an exciting idea. You heard it here first. Um, so, all right. So beyond just uh, spinning out entire AI campuses um, with their lonely single coffee machines, um, you know, more generally speaking about the the Morantix idea of having uh, founders come in and then you help them create teams and find some commercial application and then help them get their first clients and figure out uh, how they can be pivoting or scaling. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there have been listeners who think that sounds incredible. I'd love to be a part of Morantix. I'd love to be a founder uh, and have my own AI startup, either as a technical expert, like a data scientist or a software developer, or as a more business oriented person. Um, and so, and they might even want to be doing that at the Berlin AI campus. So when you're uh, admitting people into the Morantix program as a founder, how does that work? How can they apply? And then what is the process like? 
Um, I would encourage everybody, obviously, to come and, and check it out. Um, so basically what we're looking for is, or let, let's say, what is the problem we're trying to solve as a venture studio, right? We, we believe that to build a successful AI company, it's ultimately, you can Google this, a dual PhD problem, maybe even a triple PhD problem. So you need to bring together extreme domain expertise with extreme machine learning uh, expertise with business savvy. Let's say those are the three mm. poles. Uh, to, uh, to to really build impactful applications. And, and that's what we're trying to do in the studio and, and, and what we, <laughs> what future will show, how successfully we'll continue doing this, but uh, so far so good. Um, and, and I think if you're interested in such a um, interdisciplinary way of working, and if you fundamentally believe, yes, that's the way to do it, then that already that's a good starting point for you. And so we're looking, you know, the profiles of founders are quite, quite um, different. It could be, you know, more CTO type founders that are very technical, but think, oh my God, all this business stuff, like somebody needs somebody to help me with that. I'm, I'm, I don't have the right person I, I will do this with, right? That, that could be one founder. It's also, I would say, um, another profile of founders, like people who come from abroad, uh, right? US, um, we have, uh, you know, two American founders, for example, already in the studio, and who, but who want to do this out of Europe and out of Berlin. And then, you know, depending on how your biography was, maybe your connections are also a little bit limited in Berlin or in Europe. And, you know, we have a very rich network and are well-established. So we are happy to provide a home. And then, you know, there might be people who've, and we also have those profiles of founders who are serial entrepreneurs who've already founded, you know, one or two companies, um, sold or, 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 you know, had their first entrepreneurial experience. And then, but they don't really know machine learning that well. So they don't have the domain expertise in machine learning, but they have good business savvy. They know like how to make a product, how to build a solution. And, and I think, um, you know, those are maybe some of the archetypes that obviously, you know, open to, to any quirky personality uh, with, with a brilliant mind who's curious and, and entrepreneurial in the end. But um, yeah, it's a very intense journey. I mean, we like to um, put a lot of our resources at the, at the disposal of founders mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Marantix Labs brings in um, expertise in, in also building first prototypes and giving some expert advice, depending um, on, on the products. Uh, we also have a, a deep network of industry contacts, so we can bring you in touch with your first clients. And then ultimately, we're very plugged into the AI scene um, and investors, investor base uh, globally. And, and I think that's, that's just a very good mix and... and and I think what I find most humbling is that the most, that people are just nice. Honestly, like it's, it's kind of a stupid thing to say, but you know, I would still buy a used car from everybody who works here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure you can say that about everybody you've met in your professional life, but you know, I can generally say that. And I, I, I learned something from the people around me every day. And I think that's the environment. Uh, if you love that, then you should definitely check it out. Awesome. So yeah, so you've, done an incredible job of selling what a great opportunity it could be for a broad range of people, whether they are serial entrepreneurs or looking for their first uh, venture as a technical person or business person, and even if they're not from Germany or, or from Europe. Uh, but so how do they literally apply? They just go to the website and fill out a form or something? Womp womp. <laughs> Regrettably, at this point, the podcasting platform we use inexplicably and without notification stopped recording Nicole. The fortunate news is that this bug only happened to the final four minutes of her footage, and I remember the broad strokes of all of her responses, so we'll fill you in right now. In response to my question about how people can apply to be a founder at a Morantix company, Nicole indicated that you can visit the Berlin AI campus in person to get a sense of what the facility and people are like if you happen to be in the area. If you're not in the area, or if you just think it's more convenient, you can simply fill out a web form on the Morantix website, and we've included a link to that web form in the show notes. You're also welcome to reach out to her on LinkedIn. Speaking of reaching out to Nicole on LinkedIn, I definitely do recommend following her on that platform to stay up to date on all the amazing things she's doing for the global AI entrepreneurship ecosystem and for AI consulting in particular. My final question for Nicole and the only other one that was lost because of the corrupted media file was the classic final question on the Super Data Science podcast, that is, whether she has a book recommendation for us. She started off by joking that she doesn't read nearly as quickly as she might like, and that her husband apparently reads two books a day, I presume 
this was slightly sarcastic for effect, um, but that she highly recommends Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. To wrap up the episode, here is what I said in reply to her. Yeah, I too am a very slow, a very slow reader, and that is sitting on my shelf, and I am obsessed with the idea of reading it. I've read several summary posts of it with great plots, and I've actually done so in addition to the guest episodes on Tuesdays, I do these five-minute Friday episodes on Friday, and I've used for several of those, I've used information that I've gleaned from uh, content associated with this book uh, on this idea of how technology and law and good governance and science, how all of these things mean that at this time in history, we're living at by far the best time to ever be alive, COVID notwithstanding. And... Um, and yeah, we can, it's so easy to lose sight of that. So I try to I try to bring that back into the picture um, with Five Minute Fridays. And at some point, when I do actually get to the book, um, I, I yeah, I'm sure we'll provide even more fodder. So what a great recommendation! Thank you, Nicole. All right, thank you so much for enlightening all of us on the program today. Uh, thank you very much for being on the program, Nicole. And hopefully, we'll get a chance to have you on again someday. What an extraordinary communicator Nicole is, remarkably, while filming today's episode, every eloquent phrase that Nicole said was off the cuff, without a single pause to think, and without a single retake. I was left feeling thoroughly energized and excited by spending the time recording with her. In today's episode, Nicole filled us in on how we can spark AI innovation by understanding the business problem clearly, by getting started early, and by cultivating a safe innovation culture. She talked about how we can make use of large, unlabeled datasets by training models with unsupervised learning approaches, and then fine-tuning our model with a smaller set of labeled domain-specific data. She talked about how automation and reusable software components enable us to tackle separate but related AI projects efficiently, how the AI Canvas approach developed by Morantix Labs in conjunction with Nicole's alma mater of St. Gallen provides a blueprint for successful AI transformation within organizations of any size and any stage of development. And she talked about how ideal AI startup founding teams consist of a triangle of someone with ML expertise, someone with domain expertise, and someone with business savvy. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Nicole's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles, at www.superdatascience.com 543. That's superdatascience.com 543. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. All right. Thank you to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another energizing episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.